Good afternoon. It's fantastic to see so many people here. Thank you for coming and showing such an interest in, uh, in this area. Um, first of all, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Rachel Keaton and I'm the Deputy Chief Constable at Suffolk Constabulary. I've been in Suffolk for three and a half years now and uh, I've come from working in a couple of other police forces around the country. This is my most rural force and my previous experiences in places like Southampton, Leeds, Newcastle and, uh, and I have to say I absolutely love Suffolk. It's where my family originally came, come from and, uh, and it's great to be here. But we do have some work to do and, uh, and I am not here to defend the police service. Let me just say that to start with. I think we've come a long way and in the panel discussion later on we can talk about how far we've come and where we think we might be able to go to in the future. But my 15 or 20 minutes, no, probably more like 10 or 15 <laughs> minutes, is, is intended to explain what we do at the moment, to touch a little bit on where we have been and why we're where we are now, but also to flag up where I think we might be able to move to with the help of communities and other partners across the county. The first point that I think I really need to stress is everything that you've heard about until the last couple of minutes today has been about a national picture and predominantly largely London centric. We do do things differently in Suffolk and I, I'd like you to bear that in mind. The most important thing about that is that, uh, I mean from my perspective, I work in Suffolk. I appreciate that everybody, myself included, we travel and we probably all go at some stage to London or other rural um, urban areas, so we want to know that we're safe and we're going to be treated correctly with dignity and respect wherever we go in the country. That's really important in this discussion. But what I can actually influence and what I think we can influence with partners in Suffolk is what I think we will be able to do to move forward this debate and actually make a difference. Because let's face it, we've probably all had conversations about this subject area over a number of years. And what I would really like to do during my time working for the communities of Suffolk is to let's take a positive step forward of action as opposed to the conversations that we've all had in the past. Let's actually do something to make a difference. So I'd like to start with a couple of points, key messages. There are no targets for stop and search in Suffolk Police. I just want to put that out there so that that is understood. We don't work to a quota, we don't work to arrest rates, we don't work to specific targets. In fact, if anything, our performance focus has moved away from quantitative number crunching to much more about quality feedback. And I will talk later on about some of the quality feedback that we get around stop and search. Secondly, uh, we, only stop and we only support the use of stop and search when there's reasonable grounds for that stop and search. Huge amount, um, large <coughs> majority of that reasonable grounds comes from the community themselves. So we get that information fed into us through various different sources and it is on the back of that intelligence and information <coughs> that we can form grounds in order to use stop and search. And as I said, I want to just explain the processes to yourselves during this next few minutes. And the last one is very much about that transparency and scrutiny, which is very much why I and some of my colleagues are here today, but we've got those firm connections uh, with ISCRI, we've got external scrutiny, we've got internal scrutiny, and that very much is the way that I think that we can move forward, and I'll, I'll talk more about scrutiny later on. You won't be able to see the numbers here, but it's just to show that that uh, that trend, and uh, you've you've seen that earlier. So I won't spend too much talking about the facts and figures here. Um, it it has risen. The introduction this here is the introduction of the best use of stop and search, which we've just heard about, and uh, and we have seen a reduction in the number of stop searches that have been conducted across Suffolk. This is what the HMIC said about Suffolk Police. For those of you that not are not aware, um, HMIC is the Inspectorate Body. It stands for Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary. They also now inspect the Fire and Rescue Service, so it's actually nowadays HMIC FRS. And it's like Ofsted. It's, it's like other inspectorate <coughs> bodies that you'll be aware of and that you'll have come across. They're independent. They, uh, they come into police forces across the country. So there are 43 different police forces across England and Wales. Suffolk is just one of those. 
and they look at what we do and we can we get compared alongside places like the Metropolitan Police <coughs> and uh, and they have um, deemed the police force in Suffolk to be good at keeping people safe and reducing crime and the comment there highlighted about the use of coercive powers and and the importance of ensuring any learning from this is fed back into improving the workforce training. Exte effective external scrutiny is provided through public meetings. We've been held up in Suffolk as having a good model that other police forces want to come and see. We have been able to advise other police forces around the country about the good relationship that we have with the communities in order to provide that scrutiny and oversight. I actually have a copy of this slide, which I want to have there, all on, um, on the website of Suffolk Police. And uh, if I could ask you just to pass those around, if anybody is interested to take one. I can appreciate under these light conditions you can't read it. It's actually more important to say this is what is produced that can that is circulated internally and as I say externally as well through our website to the whole of the organisation on a regular basis to explain what we are, where we currently are with stop and search. You can see the degree with which the facts and the statistics are broken down. Um, it's it it identifies disproportionality where it's relevant, um, rises, falls, ethnicity is broken down as well and, uh, and again pass it around. Very open to any feedback on that, any observations that you might have but this is our part of that process for internal communication so that the organisation understands where we are ourselves. In Suffolk Police um, there are 1100 police officers and with the police staff and also the volunteers that we have, special constables, police staff volunteers, we have more than 2,000 people engaged in policing within the county of Suffolk. So it's really important to get that message out to Lower Stoff, to Bury St Edmunds, to Ipswich, to the rural areas, and so that people across the board understand what's happening in their area and, and can have that feedback and learning as an ongoing process. Uh, we've got here the total searches by way of ethnicity and no further action and I will go on to talk about, um, just briefly, because my time is getting short, about um, what no further action means in terms of the arrest rates. But first of all I just want to focus on those progress highlights of where we have come from. I've mentioned the HMIC report around stop and search um, where we don't have those targets set we are regarded externally by the inspector as being open and transparent. <coughs> um, that publication of statistics and the action plan around where we want to move to with our training. One, uh, Suffolk was one of the very first police forces to introduce the best use of stop and search. One of the best um, advantages of being a smaller force that I can appreciate having worked in much larger <coughs> police forces across the country is actually rolling out change and education and learning and development in Suffolk is, uh, is a lot more straightforward than trying to do that with somewhere like the size of the Metropolitan Police. The culture is very, very embedded within local communities. Our staff are drawn from local villages and towns. It is their own relatives, people, friends and so on who are those that are being subjected to stop search and other policing processes. So it's really uh, the force is very well connected into local communities. That's not always the case, particularly within urban areas, and so uh, we use that to our advantage, but we also get that regular feedback from our communities as well through that. So we're one of the earliest adopters, and technology, I just want to start, uh, put a couple of uh, points around technology. Yes, we do have body-worn video in, uh, in Suffolk Police, I do believe probably most police forces have it around the country now. We were one of the later ones and we adopted with caution, but now um, the frontline response police officers that you will see in uniform have that body worn video and there are those restrictions that um, Katrina has already mentioned around the, the, how long that uh, data can be kept. Um, I just want to say we don't use fingerprint recognition in this, in this county area. And we don't also have uh, facial recognition in this county area. 
at the moment. So that's where we are with our technology. Um, it will be interesting <coughs> to see how it's developed further across the country. Um, I'm not saying that that isn't something that we might consider as time goes on, but as our approach was cautious with the body-worn video, our approach will be cautious with the technology. What is right for London is not necessarily right for Suffolk, and we do what we feel is right for our communities, and we do that within the, the feedback and the consultation processes that we have as well. Just moving on, we don't have cannabis-only um, searches, which were mentioned earlier. Um, part of the external scrutiny picks that up if it has been uh, written down and recorded as uh, it's only, only the smell or the sight or the belief of cannabis. That is not a, a justified search and that will be overturned and fed back to the individual if that has carri been carried out <coughs> and that is very firmly embedded within the development and learning program that we have. Other opportunities, lots to mention here, they're, they're on there. We do make sure that if there's, uh, and I've got my warning there, so we have ride along opportunities. I just want to let everybody in the room know that you have the opportunity, it's there on the website to contact the police and we open our doors to say, come on, sit in a car, come along with us, see what a stop and search is like. I had wanted to bring some body worn video clip for you to see what a stop and search is like for those in the room that haven't had that experience. It isn't actually, I would argue, an easy process to use. One of the reasons I couldn't bring that is because most stop and searches take actually a significant amount of time to conduct. So if I spent all of my time now, <coughs> I would have used up my whole 10 or 15 minutes just by showing one body-worn video clip. That's the amount of time and effort and approach that Suffolk Police put into the procedure. I'm not saying it's perfect. Again, go back to my opening statement. I'm not being defensive here, but I am saying that we do put the time and effort into this, and I do passionately want to ensure that we get it right. But uh, I just put that right along opportunity, do take it up. It's a great opportunity just to see what we do, and we're very open to that. Um, you can read the, the other ones there for yourselves. Uh, I've mentioned the audit regime. Um, just, we have the external scrutiny through ISCRI, but we also have an internal scrutiny process. And the last comment there is that uh, to order four stop searches per month, that is every inspector in the whole of the county is required to audit four stop, at least four stop searches per month. And that equates to 48% of all forms. So we have a very high expectation of supervisors to give that oversight and then they are the ones that work directly with their staff and can feed back immediately if something is not going as it should be. That is just to say that's part of our training package that is being developed for supervisors at the moment. I want to just finish with the last point in my last few minutes around some of the disproportionality debate that we've had so far. There are um, a number of reasons, and we could probably spend a whole day, if not longer, talking <coughs> about how disproportionality is reflected in some of the actions and the figures that we've seen today and actions of police. A couple of things that I just want to throw out and we'll debate later in the panel session, hopefully, is the police will get our information, as I've said, on reasonable grounds from communities. We are, we do, we're not the moral police that police the bias that may or may not exist in communities. So if we have some people contacted, oh, well, you know, black guy down there must be dealing drugs. Now, I'm not saying we would act on that, but at the same time, if we have information coming in, we have to treat it in the spirit in which it's been given, and we look into that to see whether we believe it, whether there's supporting information or not. Now, we have to ask those questions. Why do you think they're suspicious? What is it? Give me something more but we have to prise into that to get that information out. So we are dealing with everybody who is providing us with that intelligence and information, and sometimes, sadly, other areas of society may well have their biases that we're also trying to manage around and get to the, the nub of, is, it, is there an issue here, or is it actually somebody's bias? The last point I'll end up on is, um, 
the police are an enforcement arm of society. That's that's the role. Sadly, we are called upon to, to carry out that role, but we are one of many, many partners. I've already talked about the really positive experience that I have felt in my three and a half years in Suffolk, working alongside the council, alongside NHS, charity work, some of the big private companies, but we are all engaged in how we uh, serve and provide services to the communities of Suffolk. If a child has had a pretty rough start to life through maternity services, who's been given poor housing, who goes to school and is never asked to answer a question because they're black, and becomes, for whatever reason, of a combination of partnerships poorly serving that individual, somebody who then spends more dis well, disproportionately more time on the streets, they are more likely to be a focus of policing attention and that is something that the police then have to deal with. We are not immune to any of that, we are absolutely responsible for our actions, but we have to work alongside the other parts of society that can influence a better approach to stop and search so we are all responsible and in <coughs> Suffolk I believe we can do that. In some of the urban areas I almost think that that is such a hard task but I think in Suffolk we can, we, we're we in a position where we can actually lead the way and I go back to the fact that we are small enough and we are powerful enough and we are engaged enough and passionate enough about this issue that we can do it but we need to take that step forward in action to make sure it happens. Thank you.